My name is Bruce Williamson. I'm at Louisiana State University. I've been a member of OTS for a number of years. I'm happy to be here today with Pedro Ernesto Leon from the University of Costa Rica originally and many years a contributor and leader in the Organization for Tropical Studies. Pedro, welcome. And a student at one point. And a student. Well, why don't, you know, why don't you tell us a little bit about the time when you were a student? I had no idea that that was the case. Talking about 1969, 1970. And uh, I uh, was advised to take the OTS course by a professor at the University of Costa Rica uh, who's passed away, Douglas Robinson, Dr. Douglas Robinson. And um, I'd taken the ecology courses at the university. Uh, so I thought this would be like a continuation of my previous courses. And uh, so I applied and, and I actually got into the fundamentals course uh, of the summer of 70. Yeah. Uh, and uh, of course, it, it, was, it, it was a major event for me as a biologist. Uh, it took me to another world that I didn't know. I knew, I knew ecology in, in greenhouses, but I had never really been taken to the field. And uh, so OTS uh, took us around, not just in Costa Rica. At that time, there was also a marine part to the, to the OTS course, to the fundamentals course. We actually went to San Andres Island, a Colombian island in the Caribbean. And of course, we also did you know, field projects on the ocean, you know, marine field projects. Uh, it, it was really a, a, a very impressive course with a lot of the uh, main actors, let's say, uh, in OTS, including, of course, Dan Jansen and Gordon Orians and Mildred Mathias and, and a, a huge, beautiful group of uh, colleagues, young, you know, biologists like myself, uh, we came very, very excited about the course. The course was very dynamic. It, it had the OTS format already. I mean, it was the, the f specific questions that you could answer by doing field work. And, uh, and so it, it was very, very exciting course. Uh, many strange things that I never imagined came up, uh, including a field project with, with a beetle that carries a fecal shield to defend itself. I never imagined that such things would happen a beetle that carries its excrements on the back and uses them to avoid army ants and stuff. Anyway, so uh, it, it, was, it was a grand course. I did miss the moon landing because we were in, in San Andres when that happened. Uh, but nevertheless, it did change my life. It uh -huh. made me uh, aware of the intricacy of, of, uh, of tropical ecosystems and all the invisible links that are there. They're not visible at first sight. You have to discover them, but they're there. And so it, it really uh, impacted my, my life since then. And I've, since then I've been involved. I've considered myself a, a, an activist in environmental issues in this country. So I'm, I'm very grateful to OTS and, and, and to that. It was, a course was in English and uh, I was fortunate to be able to take it because I spoke English. So, uh, <clears throat> Things have changed since then. Of course, we now teach the course in Spanish and in Portuguese, and of course, the English courses too, mm -hmm. including an undergraduate course that didn't exist at the time. It was only graduate courses. So I, I'm. This is something yeah. that uh, those are events that change your life. Change, my, right. You know, life-changing events. I would say. So it's interesting to me to hear you say that because, it, if I recall correctly, you became a, a molecular biologist, um, but. It's some, you've developed obviously a concern for biodiversity, and yeah. is that what has driven yeah, sort of I, your? I got to the University of Oregon, and <clears throat> I was uh, actually taking two uh, two graduate mm -hmm. courses. I mean, not two graduate, two graduate fields. Uh, and at one point, uh, I realized I couldn't get two PhDs. I could only get <laughs> one. And uh, there was a very exciting group doing uh, cell and molecular stuff, which is mm -hmm. what I followed. Uh, the ecology group in Oregon was very mathematical and it was, it was not tropical, so probably that had to do with the decision. Mm -hmm. But it, even then, uh, the molecular biology has brought me back to La Selva many times so, mm -hmm. for specific questions and so forth. So. But yes, that's, that's how it worked. And how did you get involved in the 
administration of OTS? At some point, you became the president? Oh. Well, as someone who had taken the OTS course and was interested in OTS, the University of Costa Rica asked me to represent them in the, uh, in the board in the, and in the assembly. And so I, I started as a, you know, a, a, as a member of, of the OTS board, I, as a vocal or as one of the, I, I don't remember what uh, position, but it end, ended up uh, at some point getting elected to, to be the coordinator of the board, yeah, the president, uh -huh. which I enjoyed very much. I met amazing people, really. I mean, you know, this is one of the, uh, it's, all, it's all, of course, uh, voluntary, but the upside is that you meet outstanding people and, and that makes it worth it. You remember any particular moments or challenges, absurdities, or complications? Oh, there were many challenges. I mean, as we know, OTS has never uh, has, has never been in a situation where money is, uh, you know, redundant or there's too much of it. It never has been that way. So it's always been a fight to, uh, you know, to make ends meet, to uh, to deal with uh, uh, with the groups of students that are coming in, to deal with with the undergraduates and undergrad students. And there's always incidents. I guess while I was president, we had a student in La Selva get bitten by a, by a Bushmaster. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was fortunately, I mean, she survived. She was taken to the hospital immediately. But it was those sorts of things that kept you on your toes all the mm -hmm. time. Along with the CEO at the time, it was, it was Chuck Snell. Uh, and, uh, but those sort of things you have to deal with as uh, as part of your duties in the board, uh, particularly because I was in Costa Rica, so I, I was able to uh, attend activities or tend to this sort of unexpected events, such as that one I just told you, which uh, many, many things, many adventures, many uh, incidents uh, of different sorts, many discoveries, many advances, including, of course, towards the end, uh, the development of a molecular biology co field course. Uh, in other words, it's a field course where molecular techniques could be used to answer questions that of an ecologic, biologic interest. So I was able to help with that, uh, which was great because it sort of fused what I actually knew about with the little environment, the little ecology that I had actually learned. Um, <coughs> and puts you back in a course, right? That's right. That's you know, right. you could recall the days, yeah. I suppose, when you were taking a course. Was interested to hearing you, you talk about the history. Of, back when you took the course, the original OTS office was in a small little oh, yes. co oh, yes. complex of rooms at That's the right. University of Costa Rica. Then it went yeah. went private for a while, and then eventually returns. Is that? That's right. Uh, at that time, it was a little office in microbiology, where uh, business was held for OTS, and and then of course OTS. When it grew, it, it actually rented houses in town, you know, different places. And, and then, of course, one of the commitments I had when I became president of OTS was to try and get the university to cede a space for, uh, for the OTS uh, uh, building, for the OTS seat. Uh, and I guess I'm, I was working with Gabriel Macaya, who was the rector. And thanks to our close relationship, I guess, in part, uh, he, and also because he's very aware of what OTS does, uh, that that was accomplished. And we're very proud of that center. And uh, many people helped. It was it was a, a huge effort to put it together, and including a, a local fundraising effort that I think it was the first time we were able to raise above a certain amount locally. And uh, so, uh, so there we are. I think that was a, a big step for OTS and. Probably a big step for Costa Rica, right? right. To, to actually oh, accept OTS, absolutely. not just as an organization working in Costa Rica, but being physically on the campus. And That's stuff. right, and, and it was going back to the origin, you know, to the origins uh, when it was part of the, it was in the campus. And you know, I'm very happy, particularly because it's across the street from my lab, where <laughs> I was most of my, most of my yeah. life working. Yeah. Well, since it was constructed in the molecular and cell biology lab, which is across the, the street from, from the building, the OTS building. So. As we're today meeting, uh, speaking on the day of the meeting of the 50th anniversary, I've, there have been several 
discussions about the past 50 years vis-a-vis -vis the next 50 years. And you and I would both like to see the next 50 years and probably won't see most of it. <laughs> but, no, uh, but we could speculate. Right, right? No, but, but you're right, the next 50 years are, uh, are a bigger challenge than this last 50 years, I think, because, because of things like climate change that we're going to have to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's happening in, in, in the tropics, too. I mean, it's not... Uh, so it's a huge challenge, of course. Uh, it includes a challenge of major extinctions. Those of us that became acquainted with the herpetofauna in La Selva and other places or in the Central Valley are very upset about yeah. experienced seeing the loss of species, particularly amphibian species. <coughs> so this, this is a huge challenge for any organization interested in nature. It's how do we uh, stop this slow but not so slow, I should say, a very fast process of extinctions that are happening, particularly with certain groups of animals. And my own acquaintance, because this, my expertise was in amphibians, is, is, tr is tremendous, it's tremendous. We don't see any more of the species we used to see in the Central Valley. I, it, it was in my sister's house, we used to run out watch the a number of species, they're gone. Not anymore, not even the sound of them. So this is very upsetting for me, and I think it should be very upsetting for tropical biologists and for biologists in general it's not I don't think it's exclusively a tropical phenomenon I think we're dealing with big changes that will affect uh, the the biodiversity of our of our countries so that's a huge challenge I, I do hope and I'm confident that OTS will carry on and will continue training young people and they're the hope we have it's those young kids that are understanding what's happening out there I can remember in our OTS course, taking photographs of Adelopus at San Vito and the Golden Toad at Monteverde. And That's right. It's one thing right. to, to consider those extinction models and extinction in general, but when you, you, you mentioned not being able to see the organisms that you saw in your lifetime. And That's right. That's, a, That's right. I, I also saw the, you know, the, the Golden Toad at some point with so courses we used to take and we saw the you know the big mating aggregations that would they're gone just like other things and that's upsetting because it touches you personally it's not something you've read about you know the polar bears or, no these are creatures that we used to have here that we used to see all the time and and that makes it so so challenging and so difficult so in that sense i, I think ots has a humongous responsibility to make people aware of these things that are happening because you are the guy, we are the guys that know about it. We, mm -hmm. We're out there in the field. And uh, uh, I, I think OTS has been an immense success of international collaboration. How many institutions do you know that can last 50 years? Not too many, literally. I mean, like we, can, we can list things that have not lasted 50 years. And here's OTS and, and we certainly expect that Maybe not us, but our kids or grandkids will be celebrating the century of OTS in, in 50 years. Pedro, tell us a little bit about the years after you were president of OTS. I know you've done many things here in Costa Rica in terms of other projects, administration. Uh, just, I, I think part of your experience with OTS allowed you to... Well, that's, to, that's right. Um, the, the OTS experience gives you a real feel for, even if it's a simplified version, for what happens out there in the rainforest. Uh, well, I mean, many things have happened since uh, I was on the board. I, I'm still in the Board of Visitors. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I've been involved with envir environmental challenges, such as the one that President Arias uh, posed, which was called Peace with Nature where the idea came up that Costa Rica could be carbon neutral in 2021, meaning that we could be energetically um, autonomous. It's called energy, energy sovereignty, if you, if you wish. Uh, so I was involved with that for three years and it was very challenging. It was a very different world. We managed, a, there were many goals that we did not reach, but there were a few that we did including a, a, you know, the creation of a fund called uh, 
Costa Rica por siempre, Costa Rica forever. And uh, also this idea that we can be carbon neutral. When people understand carbon neutrality for Costa Rica, it's not an issue of the fact that if we start producing CO2 em emissions, we're going to save the world. That's not the case at all. We're not, I mean, we're aware of the fact that we don't count much in this game. It's a matter of being energetically self-sustainable. In other words, the day that Costa Rica stops importing petroleum, which we used to run our, basically for transport, the day that we, that we manage to become, to run on clean energy, and the issue is we can do it, the numbers, the numbers add up to where we, if we use all sorts of clean energy, hydro and, and wind and solar and, and whatever, all the choices we have, we should be able to stop importing uh, oil or oil derivatives. This would make us humong humongously competitive. Think of a country that wouldn't have to depend on oil uh, for its business, for its production, for its... And so that's the dream. That's the idea now. It's, it's, not, a, it's, an, it's not an act of, you know, of demonstrating how green we are. It's an act of survival. We don't, it's a way of developing. We don't have too many choices. What are the choices? We don't, I mean, exploring our own oil resources possibly, which we probably don't have. I mean, so we see this whole process of, of carbon neutrality as, as a strategy for development. And it means becoming energetically autonomous. Is it possible? To me it is, totally. Uh, but it'll take a strong political will to do it because we have to stop using oil and commit ourselves to other sources of uh, energy and commit ourselves to clean public transport, to electric cars, to that sort of thing. Is it possible in 10 years? To me it is. Uh, many people think it's impossible. Oil, we, we, we depend 50 years on oil. For, you know. Of course, if we don't do anything about it, we will continue to depend on oil. But there's ways to start taking strong measures towards becoming energy energy independent. And I think that should be a major goal of this country because it would give us so much autonomy, so much competitiveness. Imagine the US or any major country being energy autonomous, I mean, forever. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine, I, I agree, and, um, and oil is has become such a major source of everything for us, including food. I mean, you know, we use oil to, to produce Reduce corn, food. which we sure. use to, to feed cattle. So um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge, but I think Costa Rica is the place where if we can do it, others can do it. If we can't do it, I don't know who can. It's interesting yeah. that Costa Rica has um, not only been a great place for OTS to to work and to contribute, but also Costa Rica has become a, a, a model for many tropical countries from the standpoint of uh, how do you develop clean, uh, not just energy, but clean uh, economics, for example. You know, uh, I can remember when OTS started, Costa Rica was still pretty much a, a commodity oriented sure, country sure. And, the, and the economy would fluctuate with the prices of commodities, the coffee and bananas. And in the course of 20, 25 years, OTS and the, inst the universities in Costa Rica essentially developed an ecotourism industry. Which, That's right. Which changed right. The, the country's economy. Yeah, on the other hand, when, when we are told by international institutions that do uh, polls and so forth, that we're like the most environmentally sound country, it worries us a lot because we know it's, we still have a long way to go. Uh, it you know, worries us when, the rest when of the world is, I mean, but, but sometimes we feel that we're over, oversold, you know, that, that we're not quite as, as, as committed as some people think and it makes me sad, but I think, uh, it's a challenge that Costa Rica has to face up to. I mean, we, we still haven't done our homework, really. There's still many things waiting to be done, and uh, particularly how do we get rid of uh, our dependence on oil for transport? And we're totally dependent, I mean, for oil, for oil when it comes to transport. 
because we closed our, our railroads and we a number of options like that. So that's a huge challenge. For many Costa Ricans, when, we, when we're you know, put in a, as an example, when we're set as an example, we're, we get mixed feelings. Just like when they say we're the happiest country in the world. <laughs> we are a happy country, but you know, we, we don't know how, what that means. You know, it's, it's complicated. We, we have, like other countries, major, major problems to deal with, but it is true that Costa Rica has, had a, has made some incredible commitments to environmental protection, such as the, the parks and, of course, now uh, reforestation, which has allowed the country to recover half of its forest cover. So, I mean, there are things that move in the right direction, and we hope in the end it's all going to come together. But uh, there is a political jungle with a political a lot of political conflict in there that makes things uh, difficult to realize sometimes and, and accomplish. Well, but um, it, but it, it, it is, I mean, like you said, it's, it, there are real concrete accomplishments, but some of us feel that it's not enough. I've been speaking this afternoon with Pedro Leon, a professor at the University of Costa Rica, member of the Board of Visitors of OTS and a past president. I just want to thank you again for taking time to speak with us, Pedro. It's always good to chat. No, it's delightful uh, to talk to, to you, and, and I'm always very grateful to OTS for what, what I learned at the right time when I was a young student that really affected my life. And uh, so I recommend it to my, to my students, and OTS is, is a major uh, force in tropical biology that has succeed, succeeded in sustaining itself for 50 years, and not too many institutions can say that. So I, I want to congratulate OTS too for, for this activity, and of course ATBC for meeting in Costa Rica this year. It's, it's, it's an honor to have you here.